The Bible says in Luke chapter 16, verse 19, we'll read down through uh, this story. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed of the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So this man was in a pretty tough uh, situation. Um, when I think of sores, I think of Job and how Job was in the Bible days, those, those diseases that had sores involved. It was just a really tough. They didn't have a lot of modern medicine that could take care of those uh, infections and things. So just a real tough place where this beggar was at. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he, the rich man, uh, lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, had many sons? No. Have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that we may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receives the good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, and we're going to notice these uh, few things in these next couple of verses, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went in, in unto, unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. It's easy to get caught up in everyday life, in every day, even uh, if we say, take it a step further, Christian life, where we're doing things, uh, being involved in church. And it's easy to forget that there is a place called hell. It's a real place. Uh, it's hot. Uh, it's a place where people go every day. And uh, real people go to a real place of torment for eternity. It's a place of unbelievable pain, suffering, darkness, uh, full of wickedness and Satan. And, and the worst part about it is that the place... That's without Christ and will always be a place without Christ. The beauty of the Christian life and the beauty of, of the world is that we have hope and that hope is in Jesus. But when we go to hell, it is truly a hopeless place. There is no uh, chance of reprieve or ever getting out of that place because it is a Christless place, a hopeless place. And we, can, we forget that the Bible says that there are many people that are going on the path, on their way to that terrible place. Matthew seven thirteen. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. There's a, a place called hell, and there is a wide road that many are traveling on, headed directly in that direction. The Bible says that hell enlarges itself. I don't know exactly what all that means. Some speculate that whenever there's a volcano, that it is hell enlarging herself to fit, to make room for more souls. I don't know if that's true or not. It does make some sense. The Bible talks about a lake of fire, and the lava is simply that. It is a lake of molten, burning material, and the hottest is interesting. The hottest lava that they've ever found and tested is black, a place of darkness, the Bible says. The hottest place, the darkest place. Hell. It's an interesting. I'm not going to go and say that that's exactly what it is. But the Bible talks about hell making itself bigger. Why? Because there are more and more and more people there going there every day, every year, uh, every century. Uh, Isaiah 5.14, Therefore hell hath enlarged itself and opened her mouth without measure in their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. So it can be easy to forget that people are dying and going to hell every day. Uh, and one day, if they never receive Christ, if they hear a witness and, and, and believe on Jesus Christ as their uh, Savior and their only way to, to heaven, they're going to hear the most um, hopeless, uh, the most terrible uh, three-word phrase that could ever be spoken in the history of mankind, depart from me, when God speaks to them. That is 
Uh, but the Bible says that it, it's very possible. Romans 20, verse 14, And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So it's easy to forget those things. It's easy to, to go about every day and, and talk about the love of God and grace and, and all those things, and that's a good thing. And God is a, a God of love. God is a God of mercy. He's a God of grace, and we ought not forget that. But we also need to remember that, that hell is a real place, that people are on their way there. We need to be very, very uh, diligent in sharing the gospel with other people. The Bible talks about pulling them out of the flame. But I want us to also notice that hell is not part of God's plan. Hell is not what God has for people. Um, God never intended for mankind to go to hell. Uh, that's why God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to, to make a way for us to go to heaven. Um, he is looking and trying and, and doing everything in his power to bring people back to himself. The Bible says, uh, Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man is come to seek and save that which was lost. In 2 Peter 3, nine, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So I want you to mark this down big and bold. If you take nothing else away from the lesson, I would say this is a, a, a key a fact that many people have wrong uh, in their mind, and, and they believe it, and it gives them a warped view of God. And God does not want people to go to hell. And take that a step further, God does not send people to hell. People go to hell as a punishment for their sin, but God does not send them there. Uh, try to illustrate it this way, saying God sends people to hell would be uh, like saying that a judge is a terrible person for ruling that a murderer spend the rest of his life in prison. That judge uh, accord, rules according to the facts, rules according to the evidence laid out, rules according to the law, but... That judge doesn't make a personal decision uh, to send that person uh, to prison because of their deeds. He simply makes the, the, the ruling or the judgment according to what the law says. In the same manner, God's not a monster that enjoys the suffering of man, that enjoys uh, seeing people cast into torment. Rather, God is the righteous judge that rules perfectly according to the laws and the, the parameters that he set up. And... On top of that, not only is God a righteous judge, not only does God not send people to hell, but God makes a way for us to escape. God, makes, God has made a very simple, a very, I hate to say easy, because it costs Jesus everything, it costs God very much, but a very simple, God says that all we have to do uh, to receive Christ and to have a, eternity in heaven is to believe on Jesus with the heart of a child. So God has made a way for us to escape. So it's important that we, we know that. And often people become bitter at God and they will never receive Christ simply for the fact that they believe that God wants people to go to hell, that God created hell for people. That is not, that's not true. That's not factual, it's not biblical, and it could not be further from the truth. There's so many verses, and we've looked at them, that God doesn't want any to perish, but that all should come to repentance. If God wanted people to go to hell, why would he have sent his son? So it's important that we think about that. But in, the, in the, the remainder of the lesson, we're going to talk about the ways that the Lord works, three ways that God works, three things that God uses to bring people to himself. And as we continue on in this, um, these lessons on personal evangelism and we uh, try to become uh, better at witnessing, uh, whether it be uh, in a confrontational way, uh, knocking door to door, whether it be just day to day life, um, out and about at work, uh, at home, uh, to our neighbors. We want to be becoming better and better at witnessing. And when we realize how the Lord works and we realize what God uses to bring people to Himself, I think that gives us a little more insight. So, uh, three things the Lord uses to bring people to Himself. Number one, the warning of the Word of God. The warning of the Word of God. The rich man wanted Lazarus to go back to earth and tell his family to be saved. I think it's interesting. The rich man never asked for himself to, to go out of hell. He never said, God, if you just give me a, a few days, I'll go back and uh, with, with the thought of I can get out of hell for a little bit. He didn't do that. He said, could you send Lazarus? Would you send somebody to go tell my family, go, go tell my brethren? 
Abraham's answer is very interesting. Notice in verse 29 of our text, Luke 16, 29, they have Moses. Well, what is he talking about? Moses was long gone at this time. Uh, he, Moses had been in heaven for many years. What did he mean they had Moses? Moses was used of God to give us the first five books of the Bible. When Abraham said they have Moses, what he was saying is that they have the word of God, the power of the word of God. There is, there is no thing, there's nothing that is more powerful in bringing people to Christ than God's word. And, and, and Abraham said they have the word of God, they have Moses. The first tool that God uses to bring a man to the feet of Jesus is his word. Psalm 107.20 says he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. That's why God wants his word preached. The preaching is not what saves men, but it is the power of the word that is preached that saves them. And praise the Lord, I can rest solid and sure knowing that there is nothing that I'm going to get up and say uh, in my own strength that's going to change any life that's going to save a soul. But I can rest in the fact knowing that when I get up and I read from the word of God and I, I preach the principles and, and read the scriptures uh, that God spoke uh, with his very mouth, that I know that that is the power that changes lives. That is the power that brings people to Christ. 1 Corinthians one twenty one. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Uh, Adrian Rogers often says, Do you know why we know that the word of God is the perfect preserved word of God? Because it's with, withstood and, with, and has withstand during uh, many terrible, shoddy messages. But yet the word of God is still true, it still stands, and though we get up and, and uh, as preachers, we don't do it anywhere near justice, and uh, we misspeak and we misquote and maybe even misinterpret a scripture, the word of God is still true, it's still powerful. God doesn't need me uh, to over-explain his word, he just needs his word presented. And uh, I have been trying to follow this uh, outline uh, when preaching is to point people to the Word of God and then get out of the way. And God's Word will do the work. I want to show you, uh, read you a story uh, given by uh, Tom Sexton. He was a, a brother, her pastor, Clarence Sexton's brother. Uh, he was saved uh, and at a, at a later year in life and and uh, he began uh, getting involved in church as an adult, and he started working on a bus route. And he shares a story that uh, illustrates the power of, of the Word of God very beautifully. Ta he's talking about being on this bus route that he started working on as a new Christian. On that bus route was a man by the name of Jerry. Jerry was a drunkard. I knew him. I had worked with him before, uh, before I was saved, and then I continued to work with him a little bit after I was saved. Jerry's wife had run off with a man and moved into a trailer park in Bartow, Florida. Every weekend, Jerry would go out and try to find her. One day, he did find her, and, and Jerry pleaded with her to come home, but she would not come home. Finally, one day, she called Jerry and said, Jerry, I want to come home. He said he had gotten to the point, he said, I don't want you to, to come home anymore. And she said, if you don't let me come home, I'm going to kill myself. He said and kill yourself. She took her five kids, sat down in the living room, took a gun, pointed it to her head, and pulled the trigger. I drove Jerry to Bartow, Florida to get those five kids. I was saved not long after that, and the first people that I wanted to ride my bus were Jerry and his kids. Jerry did not want anything to do with church, because, and, but he let his children ride the bus. Jerry had a little girl by the name of Mona. She rode the bus, and she was not quite four years old, and so she couldn't read. But we started memorizing the Bible, and Mona would go home and try to memorize the plan of salvation. Romans 3.23 reads, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. She would get on the bus and say, All have been bad, and God is mad. I would say, I would say That's good enough, Mona. We went through the whole Romans road, and then we would teach John 3.16. I came home from work one day, and my wife said, Honey, you're not going to believe it, but... Mitch called me and said that he led Jerry to the Lord. Mitch was a deacon that lived in the same trailer park as Jerry and his children. I got in my car and drove to Jerry's home. Notice this. 
Inside that trailer were beer cans everywhere. In the middle of all the beer cans was the Bible verse that we had given out on the bus. Every night, in a drunken stupor, Jerry would sit down and go over the plan of salvation and memorize the verses over and over and over and over again until Mona would finally get it. Jerry loved those kids and wanted them to know the verses so they could get the little prizes that we gave to the children who memorized the verses. God's word took hold of Jerry's heart. One afternoon, he flagged down a, a deacon uh, that he knew lived in the trailer park and said, Mitch, you have to tell me what I need to do to have peace with God. Mitch took a Bible and led him to Christ. When I left his house that day, I was shouting, and I soon saw Jerry riding the bus. He got baptized at church. There is power in the word of God. Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there is power. So the first thing that God uses to bring people to himself is his word, the power of the word of God. Secondly, the witness of a child of God. The witness of a child of God. Luke 16.29 Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. The prophets are the ones who have been born again. They're those of, who knew Christ. That's us. If you're saved, you are supposed to be a witness. Matthew 5, 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. God wants every man to have a light, and that light is the gospel. That's why... Uh, we have uh, had someone recently said, um, I don't want my children to attend your uh, classes uh, because you promote good works. And uh, not all the kids are able to do all of the things that you know, promote, whether it be doing a good deed or passing out a track. Not everyone's able to do that. And uh, I don't think that, that you ought to promote good works because good works uh, are not contingent upon salvation. That's true. We don't ever teach or preach that good works are contingent upon salvation. But when you read this verse and you fully comprehend it and understand it, you see why God compels us to do good things. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and pat you on the back and tell you how much of a good Christian you are. No, that they may glorify your Father which is in heaven. Good works, the way that we live, the things that we do, are a, a, a part of what God uses to bring people to himself. It's a part of fulfilling the Great Commission. So I'm not saying that if you're not doing good works that you're not going to be saved. That you could, you, you could trust Christ with all your heart, believe him for salvation, and then never do anything for yourself, be the most selfish person in the world, and you would still go to heaven. Uh, I don't think you would have the rewards or lived as blessed of a life as what you could, uh, but you could do that because God still saves selfish people. But when we do good works, when we live our Christianity in a way where people can see it tangibly, it is something that God can use to bring people to himself. John 1, 7, the same came for a witness to bear, this is talking about the light. Uh, the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. It's talking about John the Baptist. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. John was simply... Uh, a soul winner. He was a witness. He was a forerunner. He was saying, hey, somebody's coming who is going to be the Savior. He's going to be the one uh, who is going to save us. Look at him. John wasn't doing it to get a following for himself. He was simply pointing people to Jesus. And that's simply our job as believers. It's just to point people to Jesus. If we're ashamed of the gospel or we hide it or we just simply refuse to share it, how will lost people hear? You know people that I don't know. You come in, in contact with people on a daily basis that no one else will ever come into contact with. And are you willing to be a witness to those people? 2 Corinthians 4, 3, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. People need to hear the message of Christ, and we are supposed to take that light to a lost and dying world. So, number one, what, are, what does God use to bring people to him? The witness of the word of God. Number two, uh, the, no, excuse me, the warning of the word of God. The, it's number two, the witness of a believer. And number three, the working of circumstances. The working of circumstances. This man, the rich man who died, had five brothers. They lost someone who was near and dear to them. That is a circumstance that God could use to bring them to him. God uses circumstances to bring lost people to him. I want to read another story 
um, from the, the same man, Brother Sexton, about uh, understanding the importance of how God uses circumstances to bring people to him. Brother M.J. Parker, in my opinion, was the greatest soul winner, or one of the greatest soul winners I've ever known. He started the Evangelistic Bus Ministry of America. M.J. Parker never worked on staff. He was simply a layman in the church. Dr. Robertson told me that Mr. M.J. Parker would bring people that he had personally won to Christ down the aisle week after week for years. He was a tremendous soul winner, but just a layman. I had the privilege of knowing him. When I was on staff at the church, Brother Parker told me one day that he wanted to teach me something. Brother Parker said, Tom, I want you to come pick me up, and I want to show you something. It's very important that you learn this. So I went by to pick up Brother Parker. When I did, Mrs. Parker put, uh, put, helped him get into the car. He was getting older. He gave me, she gave me a bottle of, uh, of pills and said, Now, Tom, if Brother Parker falls over, put two of these under his tongue and take him to the hospital. I said, hold on, I don't want him dying in my car. She said, no, I don't think he'll die today. He may, but if he does, that's okay. He's going to heaven. Brother Parker was laughing. Don't worry about that. I'm not going to die on you, Tom. Come on, let's go. Let's go to Rossville, Georgia. He went down to Rossville, Georgia and pulled up at, at, at a car lot. I could tell later on that he had done this a few times. They had a little repair shop there. He rolled down the window and said, Tom, blow your horn. I blew my horn, and a guy came out. Brother Parker said, is, this, is Dave here? Tell him Cuz Parker's out here. In just a few minutes, this older gentleman came walking out. He said, Brother Parker, God bless you. It's good to see you. I'm so glad that you were able to, to get around out of the house a little bit. Brother Parker said, Dave, this is Tom Sexton. He's the new bus director at the church. I want to teach him something. Brother Dave, are you still a Baptist uh, deacon at the church? He said, yes, sir. You know I am. He said, I want Tom to know something. Dave, how did you get saved? Dave said, well, Brother Parker, you led me to the Lord. He said, how often did I come by? Dave said, well, Brother Parker, you came by every week. He said, how long, how long did I come by? Dave said, for 26 years. Brother Parker looked at me and said, uh, God never gives up. Circumstances always change. Stay after them and don't ever stop. And that is just a great illustration of how in the life of somebody who just outright says, I am not interested in the gospel, that we ought not to write that person off, and I'm, I am guilty of doing that. I'll put on uh, my uh, list of, 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 of door knocking, not interested, or, you know, don't go back, they were rude. And though we not, not to go to, you know, to that house, you know, and just terrorize people, that's a poor testimony, but circumstances changed. That old man who was uh, an angry, get-off-my-lawn type of guy, his wife may die this winter. And when we go back in the spring, he may be in a much different situation and maybe a little more willing to hear the gospel. So it's important to understand that, yes, God uses his word. God uses the witness of, of, of us, of the saints, but God also uses circumstances. Often God uses circumstances to bring people to himself. That's why we need to be faithful. Second. Peter 3, 9, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's important that we make the gospel readily available. We are the feet that take the word and take the witness to people. We allow God to do the work uh, inwardly through the Holy Spirit, through the power of his word. But it's important that we put feet uh, to what God has asked us to do. And I hope this gives us a better understanding of how the Lord works. He works through his word. He works through the witness of others. And he works through circumstances.